So now that we have a pretty good idea of how to build sequential devices uh, in a general description, we can build out a couple of standard sequential devices that we will use when we build our data path. Uh, this is just like in the combinational logic section where we built out a few standard combinational logic devices like multiplexers and decoders. Here we're going to build registers and then we're going to build counters. Both of these are standard devices that we will end up using uh, in our data path. So a register is the first one we'll build, and it's a pretty straightforward device. The idea is to store and be able to manipulate a collection of individual bits that are treated together like a uh, word. Uh, so a, a collection of bits that represent a number or some other piece of information. And the size of these registers is going to dictate the, the sort of size of the data path of the computer that we're going to build. So a 32-bit computer has 32-bit chunks of information passed around as stored and retrieved in 32-bit registers. A register is just a collection of these bits. So we're going to build a register uh, that is going to be able to store and also shift. Uh, this is another function that these registers often have, which allows us to move the information in the register up or down by one bit uh, that has a particular functionality, as you'll see. And then we'll build some counters. We built general purpose counters already in our sequential design process, uh, but we'll build a couple of uh, specific counters that just count sequentially, one, two, three, four, five, and you'll see that there are some uh, standard simplifications that we can make in that process as well. So a register is just a collection, it's going to be a collection of D flip-flops, uh, because a D flip-flop is the flip-flop that we use when we want to just store a piece of information. We present at the input of the flip-flop the information that we want to store. And then the design process for a register is very straightforward. All we do is present at the input of the D flip-flop, and we use a multiplexer to select what we're going to present at the input of the D flip-flop to store what we want to store. So we're going to build one slice of the register first. We call this a bit slice, and this is just like when we built the adders and subtractors. We built a slice of the device that will handle one bit at a time, and then we expand that design to the entire device. So in this case, we'll build a single slice, and this register example that we're going to walk through can do four different things. It can store the information that's already there, so make no change. Uh, it can shift the information left to right, and it can load new information from the outside world. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So again, we have a multiplexer, and we have um, a design principle that we've used in the past, uh, you know, in other, other uh, programs, the multiplexer might sort of have a different shape, and we might have the control lines out the side, for example, but in the uh, LogicWorks program, it's just a box, and the control logic is right here. And then depending on the control inputs, one of four possible data inputs are routed through to the data output of the uh, multiplexer, and then that's just presented to the input of our flip-flop. Now, the four uh, different functions that this particular register will have, first of all, we can load information in from the outside world, that's for uh, if the control logic is set to 3. Uh, if the control logic is set to 1 or 2, uh, then we might shift. And that means that we'll bring information for this particular slice from the left, uh, to, or sorry, from the right if we're shifting left, or from the left if we're shifting right. And we'll see how that works once we stack the uh, bit slices together. And then the last function is just to store the current value. Now, this is something that people sometimes get confused about because a flip-flop generally has this storage procedure already built in. Why do we need a multiplexer to do it? Well, the storage process for a D flip-flop relies on the clock to be either high or low. And we really want the clock to be synchronized across all of these devices. We want every device in our machine to be on the same clock. So we don't really want to modify that clock very much. We're going to have that clock just be its value. So instead, what we're going to do is take the current value that's stored in the flip-flop, and we're going to route it back and present it as one input to the multiplexer. And then if that's the function that we choose, then that value gets routed through and presented back at the input again. And to store then information, we just <laughs> store that information around and around, and it just sort of reinforces that same value, whatever it is, back again at the input of the D flip-flop for this particular bit slice. So if we're going to put a few of these together, it looks like this. Each individual slice can take information in its multiplexer inputs from the current value for D0. It can take information from the uh, 
slice to the right if we're going to be shifting to the left. It can take information from the slice to the left if it's going to be shifting to the right. And it can take information from the outside world in a load. So those are the four different things that each bit slice can do. And you can see that if you ask this register to shift a value one bit to the right, then each, um, each flip-flop will take a value from the multiplexer that is routed from the previous flip-flop. And they will just go one to the next, oops, that's not right, uh, one to the next, one to the next, and the whole value will just be shifted one bit to the right. And the same for the left. If you're going the other direction, it will shift one bit to the left. Now, when we shift to the right, we have to make a decision as to what to do to this top bit because there's no value to shift in. So we have to have an input from the outside world that we'll bring in. And usually we just shift the zero in because it's simpler. Uh, and the same thing for the left. If we're shifting, from the, shifting to the left, we have to have a value at the lower bit uh, to shift some value in. Uh, this does bring up the question of what actually is happening when we shift bits. Uh, this idea of shifting a collection of bits will be very useful later on. Um, the, the simplest thing this does is actually multiply or divide by 2. And let me give you an example of how that works. If we have uh, a, say, a, a four-bit number that looks like this, 1, 0, 1, 1, say, for example, and if we say, what is that number? That's 8, uh, and 2, and 1 is 11. If we were to shift that number to the left by 1, and we were to shift a 0 into the bottom bit, then this 1 moves here, this 1 moves here, this 0 moves here, and this one moves here. And this becomes, instead of 8 and 2 and 1, this is now 16 and 4 and 2, and 16 and 4 is 20, this is 22. So a shift to the left is a multiplication by 2. And this makes perfect sense when you think about it, because if you take a number in base 10, say 38, if you were to shift it to the left by putting a 0 in the bottom bit, and then moving the 8, and then moving the 3, we get 380, which is a multiplication by 10. And so a shift in the bit positions of numbers corresponds to a multiplication by the radix of the, of the system that you're using. And so a shift in base 2 is a multiplication by 2. If we were to shift to the right, it would be a division by 2. There is one problem, though. If you remember, the device we just built only has 4 bits. So really, if we take this number, which is stored in those 4D flip-flops, and we're shifting it to the left, we put a zero here, this one goes here, this one goes here, this zero goes here, this one goes where? It's gone, because there are only four bits. We've only stored four bits, we've only built a four-bit register. So in fact, we don't get 11 times 2 equals 22. We get 11 shifted by 2 gives us 1 and 2 and 4. This is 6, which is not 11 times 2. So this idea of shifting corresponding to a multiplication by 2 only works if we have enough space in the representation to store the new value. And this is generally true in all computer mathematics. You've got to make sure that there's enough space in the representation. And if there isn't, you have to find out how to identify that, to say there's a problem here. We could not fit the answer in the representation, and we may have an error. But we'll get to that when we do more complex computer uh, multiplication. So this is the idea then of building a register that can accommodate uh, loads and stores and shifts. Uh, and this is a general purpose design process. We build design one slice, and then we can expand that design. And you can make a register that can do anything. You can make a register that can um, reset to zero, right? Maybe instead of shifting, we want a register where one of the inputs brings in a zero to every value. Maybe it's really important that we be able to reset the value of this register, clear it all out to zero. Or maybe we want to be able to add one to the entire register at some point. We call this an incrementing register. So there's lots of different things you can do to register, but in general, this is the design process. So a register in its simplest form is just a collection of D flip-flops that stores a single unified piece of information. The next general purpose sequential device we're going to build is called a counter. Uh, now, we have built general uh, counters in the sequential design uh, units of the, of the work that we've done so far. And so if I give you a sequence of states, you can build a machine that will process through that sequence of states. 
but I wanted to build out a one, two, three, four, five counter just to see if there was anything that we could recognize about the design process. So what we're going to do is we're going to build through this design process and get ourselves a counter that counts from zero to seven and then back to zero again and see what that looks like. So the state diagram doesn't have any inputs, doesn't have any outputs, it's just from one state to the next every clock cycle. Here's the design process for that. Again, we have our current state, 0, 0, 0. The next state will be 0, 0, 1. And say if our current state is 7, our next state will be 0. So that's the full cycle then. So what we can do, and you might wonder why this is all colored <laughs> the way it is, but this is to remind us of our design process, that we take for any particular min term, which in this case is the cur current state that the machine is in, we take the state variable for any particular one of the three state values, and then we see what transition happens in the context of that min term, and then we cause that transition to happen based on the excitation table of the JK flip-flop. If I'm in state zero, I want to be in state zero, I can either hold, which is a zero zero for JK, or reset, which is a zero one. And so the J has to be zero, but the K can be whatever we want. So then zero becomes zero, zero becomes zero, zero becomes one, that's one X. And then again, one become one, that's X and zero, one becomes zero is one X. And we've been through this design process before. You can follow through and see um, how this works. The interesting thing to me is that if we look at Q0, zero, zero becomes one is X one, one becomes zero is X, uh, sorry, zero becomes one is one X, one becomes zero is X one. And this is uh, what happens for the entire, uh, for the entirety of the lowest bit of this counter. It's always alternating. If it's zero, in the next state it'll be one. If it's one, in the next state it'll be zero. And this makes sense if you think about it, because if you're just counting up numerically, um, it'll alternate between odd and even numbers. And this last bit can tell us whether the number is odd or even. So this all seems to make sense. So then we will go through our kmap process, which is six kmaps, one for each flip-flop input, and here they are. And again, you can go through this design process you want, but I've simplified it here. The uh, j and the k for the bit two is actually j as the same, and it doesn't it wouldn't necessarily have to be, but if you look at it, um, depending on where the don't cares are, you can see that it actually simplifies to the same value, q1, q0. Then J1 and K1, again, simplified to the same value, which is Q0. And J0 and K0, the entirety of the K map is filled with either ones or don't cares. So the whole thing, you can just say the value is one and it'll be correct. And again, this sort of makes sense if you think about it because one of the functions of the JK flip-flop is if J and K are both one, the machine will toggle or invert. And if we want that first bit, that lowest bit uh, to be toggling, every time, then it makes sense to just provide a one to both inputs, and then every cycle it will toggle. So it's always a good idea when you're doing a design like this to look at an, an answer like that. J and K are both one. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it kind of does. So then we can draw the circuit, and again you can see that the bottom inputs, or the, the JK inputs for Q0 are both one, and then the JK inputs for Q1 are both Q0, and the JK inputs for Q are both Q1 and Q0. And that's the three bit counter. But we can start to recognize something interesting about the design and see that there may be the possibility of some sort of an incremental design. If you wanted to build a Q3 here at a third bit, what would that look like? Well, as it turns out, we can generalize this process and recognize uh, that in fact, the logic for the design of the counter relies on the idea of having the J and K flip-flops, or the J and K info inputs cause the flip-flop to toggle, but the question is when does each bit toggle? And if you watch the process, each bit actually toggles when all of the bits below it are one. So if you watch this one here, when all the bits below it are one, it will flip either from one to zero or from zero to one. And so you can write out a generalized expression that says each bit will flip when all the bits before it are one. And we flip by either making JK0 to hold or JK1 to complement. And so in general, we can build a counter of any shape and size by recognizing that the nth JK inputs 
are going to just be the AND of all of the current state of the bits below it. But we can also recognize that if you look at the current state of the bits one below that, that's actually the JK inputs of the previous one. <laughs> so we can take these together and recognize that this can build a recursive definition, is that the JK inputs at any bit is the current value of the state below it, as well as the input of the state below it, assuming that the input at the lowest value, JK zero, is one because whenever you have a recursive definition, you always have to have a, an initial condition. So what we've now done is constructed a generalized up counter that can be as many bits as we want. And each bit just depends on the bit below it. The input and the output to the bit below it create the input to the next bit. And with that process, you have the entirety of the generalized up counter. We can go one step further and, and construct an enable on this one. Uh, what this does is it allows us to tell the counter to go or not go. If the enable is zero, we don't proceed. If the enable is one, we proceed. And this is simply an input to the lowest level JK inputs. Because if the JK inputs at the lowest level is zero, it won't flip and none of the rest of the flip flops will flip. And if it's one, it'll proceed through the counter as we've seen. So this is, and I think this is really neat. This is the design for the generalized up counter. Each bit that we add, each bit slice that we add is just an AND um, of the inputs from the last bit and the outputs from the last bit. Let me see if I can make that clear. The inputs for the last bit was generated by this AND gate. And then all we have to do is take the output from that bit and that input and those two together make the input to the next bit. And so we can stack these one on top of each other and create a counter of any size that we want. And the, the, the logic shows us that what we're doing is at each level, we're anding together the current value of all of the states below it. So that if these are all one at the same time, one and one and one, that will cause this one to flip. And if any of them are not one, it won't flip. And it works just like an odometer in a car. In a car, the uh, odometer will turn over when all the numbers below it are nine. If you have nine, 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 then it turns over to one, zero, 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 zero. With a binary counter, the same thing happens when the, well, let me run that again. Yeah, when all of the bits below it are one, then it flips. When all the bits below it are one, when these three are one, that one flips. <clears throat> so that's our generalized up counter, and we have a nice design for that. So now we've built registers and we've built counters. And you can take this design procedure and you can build a counter that can count up or count down. There's lots of good reasons to have these kind of things as well. You can build a counter, again, using that same kind of uh, bit slice procedure that maybe holds the value, counts ups, count, counts up, counts down, clears its value to reset. Lots of different uh, functionality you can build into a generalized uh, counter. Now there's one more device that I'm not going to walk through with you here. I'm going to encourage you to have a look at these notes. We're not going to worry too much about the construction of random access memory because it is just one step above the idea of a register. It's not exactly a register. As you'll see in the notes, uh, usually RAM, uh, RAM is constructed using the kernels of an RS flip-flop that is then modified in the similar way that the D flip-flop uh, is, is sort of constructed from an RS latch, I should say. Um, but in general, what we'll do when we actually build out our machines is we'll just put a, a, um, a generic box down and say, this is a RAM and it's going to store this much information. We put an address in and we get a word out. And the functionality is here and you can build it for yourself. Um, but more, it's, it's going to be an abstract concept for the rest of the, of the course. So have a look at this um, and then we will proceed from here to look at some of the more in-depth mathematics uh, that is used in the arithmetic logic unit, which is the sort of mathematical heart of the computer.